my cousin and a very good friend of mine, Mike Gill, rang me up one night and he said, I've got a great book for you. And he said, this is gonna make your name um, in terms of a writer. A mutual friend of his uh, had introduced him to Mark on a night out around St. Helens Town Centre. Uh, and he said, you know, he's a Paralympian, he's achieved all these things. And shockingly for someone who lives in the same town as, as Mark, I'd never heard of him and I'd never heard of what he'd done. Um, but he arranged to meet him, sat down with him, and as soon as I spoke to him, I rediscovered my love for, for writing, to be honest, because I thought, this is a story that has to be told. I'm gonna kill all by myself, cos I don't wanna let you down, cos I got so much inside, but I ain't never let you go, I ain't never let you go. This must smash it up, this must smash it up, this must smash it up. Mark Eccleston, I mean, I saw him play, and I thought he was an awesome player. He was, he was rapid, he was really speedy, uh, you know, everyone saw him as the main player in GB. I look at it this way. Before I had my accident, there was a million things I could do. After, there was 900,000 I could do. Now, the choice is yours. Do you worry about the 100,000 that you can't do, or do you crack on with the 900,000 you can do? Spirit and willpower count for everything if you're disabled. You have to be willing to push yourself to the limit. Mark was born in 1970 in Clockface, 30 miles from Manchester. His parents still live in the house in which he was born. His father worked in a local glass factory and his mother in the local school. His brothers loved sports, especially rugby league, which is almost a religion in St Helens. That's what I wanted more than anything, was to, to play rugby. I wanted to be a professional rugby player. One of the teachers at school, um, he had connections with St Helens Rugby Club, so he set up a team there. I started playing there, went there, started playing, um, got runner-up in the Player of the Year. Mark left school and hoped to get a trial for St Helens Rugby League Club. He had time on his hands, lots of time. It's uh, early September, and um, this one particular day, it was, it was hot, and from my bedroom window I could see the swing, I had a look, seeing that there was a lot of people over there. Then he said he was going out. I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm just going out with lads. And I said to him, there's athletics on the television. And he said, I don't want much women playing athletics. Every year we'd, when the farmers had cut his corn, we'd just collect the straw together and jump out the tree into the straw and stuff like that and run down the banking and do somersaults and make camps and stuff like that because it was away from all the parents where you could get up to no good and stuff like that. So I basically just ran down this embankment, tried to do a somersault into the haystack over the lads and totally balls it up. I mean, we was only, what, 14, 15 years of age and uh, I think uh, that guy pulled tumors on his legs for to see if he'd jump or something like that and stuff like that and you knew then it was something was wrong. I was, I was then struggling to breathe, I couldn't breathe, and I, I had a really high-pitched voice. And, um, you know, I just said to him, I said, you're gonna, you're gonna have to move me, I can't breathe. Someone knocked on the door and said that Mark had fell and he couldn't get up. So I got our Michael to go out because I couldn't climb the fence because the fence was like the ones here at the back. And uh, he went over. And then I followed and I was still looking at the fence and then he come back, he said, I'll have an ambulance. So they came, put me on the, you know, put the net brace on, put me on the stretcher, got me on the ambulance and uh, off we went. Told them to put the siren on as we were leaving. So everyone on the estate knew something was going on. He wasn't able to move his legs and he was complaining of extreme amount of paresthesia, pins and needle in his both arms. We went to the hospital, Western Hospital. Um, and we seemed to sit there for hours and hours before somebody had come and tell us what was going on. And they started cutting my clothes off 
and then I was going mad because I, you know, I was, but that, that that was it then. That's all I remember. They were cutting my clothes off and they were pulling straw out of my clothes and straw out of my hair. Mark had broken his neck. His spinal cord was severed high up at what is known as C6. It meant he had no feeling and no power in his legs. And we transfer him for global and comprehensive management of his spinal cord injury next day. And we, we reduce his dislocation. I reduce his dislocation by skull traction and manipulation of his neck. I had one of these uh, Duran Duran mullet things going on. And um, they shaved it. And then they give me a needle, which I hate needles. I'm scared of needles. Um, and then they had like this hand drill thing to drill a hole in your head to put traction on. And you know, you can see the scar. That's the scar from the traction? That, that's, that's the scar from the traction that they actually put into your head. So the next morning we all got up and I think it was his uncle John that took us. And I didn't know, I mean, even though he lived so near Southport, I didn't know there was a spinal unit there where it was. Well, uh, Mr Krishnan, he's dead now, bless him. Well, he, he came in and, you know, he just said to me, do you know what you've done? I said, well, obviously I know I've done something to my neck, damaged some bones in my neck. He said, is there anything you want to know? And I said, yeah, can I, when can I start rugby training? Because rugby training was, was, was starting early September. And he just, he just so matter-of-factly said, well, uh, sorry, Mark, but you're never going to play rugby again. And I thought, Jockey, you know, you know what, that just may as well kick me in the nuts, you know what I mean? It hurt less. <laughs> and um, obviously I, that knocked me back a little bit, so I thought, well, you know, obviously I'm coming to be coming out of here with a limp or, you know, a dodgy neck or something, you know, I didn't, I didn't realise the enormity of the situation. And I said, well, why am I going to play rugby? And he said, well, there's a strong possibility that you're never going to walk again. I just, I just couldn't think, it wouldn't just sink in. Because I had never seen a spinal injury before. I never, you know, I didn't know anybody that had a spinal injury, so I didn't know what, what the future held, like, only that he was seriously ill and it would take time to give us a, a good picture of the, the level of the injury and what he was capable of doing and what he might not be able to do. And I was petrified. Yeah. Oh, it was awful. It was really, really bad. I saw them upset and that, that probably worse than anything, you know what I mean? When you see your parents upset, that, that. Yeah, just, when you th I mean, you remember all them more and there's, a, there's other people in the room and that, that was probably the hardest. Like, that was harder than being there because you're young and naive and you don't know what's going on at the time. When, you, when you're tall, like uh, like he's, he, Mark said to us, uh, I'm never going to walk again and stuff like that. And you can see like he's, his head strapped down to the bed and stuff like that. It's, not nice. I just remember saying sorry to my mum because, you know, an hour later she'd said someone's going to get hurt over there. And I knew straight away I'd done something. He's angry with himself, you see, because he knew he shouldn't have gone in the field. He knew that he shouldn't have been on that tree. So he knew that he, he was in the wrong. I developed the biggest chip on the shoulder you could imagine. Um, I was very aggressive, I was very angry. Which, you know, you can understand, I'm a 16-year-old kid, I've just had everything I wanted taken away. I'm on a ward with a load of adults, some of them who were pretty nasty, you know, they'd, they'd give you loads of shit. And... Mark's family went to see him often. On one of these visits, his father wandered through the hospital. I went into the recreation hall and there was two men playing table tennis in wheelchairs. And I went back... Mark asked me where I'd been, I said, I'd been having a walk round and watching the two men playing table tennis. And he said, how can you play table tennis in a wheelchair? I was still under the impression that I wouldn't be able to do anything. You know, I'd have to have people pushing me around and washing me and wiping my ass and, and all this lot. And the thought of that horrified me. When I, when I first started going home for the weekend, you get there and, and you're the only one in the chair and you feel like a freak, you feel like a, a zoo exhibit where everyone's looking at you. I'm 
made it so that I got picked up when it was dark. So when I got home, I was getting out of the car, you know, because back then I needed help getting out of the car. So, you know, my dad had had to get my legs out and put a sliding board under my ass and drag me out of the car. And I didn't want anyone seeing this. I was, I just wanted to die. It was horrible. And my mates took me to the pub and the pub was packed. It was Friday night, I went in and it was just like parting of the Red Sea. They all just moved out of my way and started clapping. And I'm like, what are you clapping for? It felt like I was being clapped for being in a wheelchair. And I fucking hated it. Hated it. And I, I went back to the hospital and I, I was in tears. I, I just didn't want to go home again. So, you know, back then you'd, you'd have leg bags on and, and uh, you know, you'd have like a condom attached to the leg bag. So when you had a pee, you'd pee straight into this leg bag. Well, I used to rip it off so it'd rip the skin. So, you know, and, and, and say to the nurses, oh, I've got a, a ripped skin on my dick, you know what I mean? I can't go on this weekend. The, the problem with anyone with a high level injury is that before you can functionally start to improve, then you've got to develop a lot of strength and stamina. And that's very frustrating. You see, you know, everyone else around you progressing because they're that bit further down the line and you're not. So, of course, there was frustration. There was a lot of tears. There was a lot of anger. But with, despite all that, an awful lot of self-determination. He was a very strong young man. He, he, he'd been very fit throughout his life anyway, very, very keen sportsman, um, and was, was really, therefore, once he could get down to departments, very keen to progress quite quickly. There was no realistic hope his condition would improve. Cells in the spinal cord don't grow back. But some people defy the odds. The nurses kept on telling Mark about another young man who'd lost the use of his legs. And I always remember I said to him, you know, because the nurses, when they put you to bed, they'd put pillars between your knees and under your feet and in your back so you wouldn't get pressure sores and marks and stuff. And I said to him, how many pillars do you have at night? Because I had something like five pillars, six pillars. And he just laughed at me. He said, I don't have pillars. He said, the only thing I have between my legs is women. I thought, brilliant. It was then that, you know, I started to believe that it's not all doom and gloom. Some good friends of, of my family raised some money for me. They bought me a sports wheelchair, which was light, and I was able to push on my own, and it was red, and it was all flashy and everything else. So meeting this, this, this lad and getting the chair were around the same time. And, you know, all of a sudden, I was thinking, well, actually, I can do things. And, and I wanted to go back to clock facing my new chair to show everyone my new chair. You know, they'd raised the money. Um, I wanted to show them that, it's this flash wheelchair, it cost two grand, it was brilliant. And that's when it all started to change. Mark learned to drive and got seriously into sports. Started playing rugby for Southport, the wheelchair rugby that is. And we played against Rob's team, I think it was either East Midlands or Lodgemore, Sheffield, one of those he was playing for. And um, played against him and then later on that night, Everyone goes to the, the bar that was on site. And a couple of the lads that played for Southport knew Rob. So um, they introduced me to him. There's only a couple of people outside my family I'd take a bullet for. And uh, Rob's definitely one of them. I played for a team called East Midland Broaders, and Mark played for a team called the Southport Sharks. Sharks, yeah. So the first time I met him was an, as an opposition. He was a better player than me, and, and he was he was doing stuff on me, and, and I thought he was right. Arrogant little shit. So they, they went and wound me up. And that wound me up even more, to the point where I was like growling at them. Rob is one of the few he'd take a bullet for because in the last 20 years they've shared triumphs, adventures, highs, lows and more beers than either of them can remember. Today they travel all over Britain training the disabled.
these chairs up for right. development. That's why normally I would just come up in the car and train. But to get up here with the extra chairs, I'll have to bring up the bring the van up. Fucking hell, we're going on a world trip in this, man. All right, isn't it? One of their aims is to introduce newly disabled youngsters to sports. It's good therapy. It improves physical skills and mental toughness. This evening, youngsters who have just had their accidents are mixing with international players from the British team. Or oh, the new ones, if you want to come up here, I'll just show you a few ball drills and things. He's in my chair, mate. Byron is here. Who's Nathan? Steve. And Hi, all right. This is Mark. I'm Rob. The hardest bit is just is getting the over the initial shock of it all, and then you know, yes, you've got to learn how to do everything again and, and do this and do that. But you know, look, I look on all that stuff as a challenge. You know what I mean? Sometimes you might you might get obsessed with the chair and think that everything is the chair. You know, if someone's looking at you, well, if a bird's looking at you, she might just look, be looking at you because she fancies you. She might not be looking at you because you're in a chair. You know, and I've had people stir at me. So and my friend to me said, when you go out, your people might not might stare at you, but he said, these are beer magnets and you can pull everything. Oh, yeah, you've got to use them to your advantage. You know, the, the, the best person I've ever seen at pulling birds, best person I've ever seen at pulling birds, percentage-wise as well, this ugly bastard here. Charisma, that's what it is. He's got the charm. He, 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 uses, that, he uses that thing to the thing, don't you? I can't say too much because Tina's behind you. Let's have a look. Where are you? Hi. Tina, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Why aren't you dressed so Lily? Well, I was dressed uh, like an ice cream woman, I suppose, or a tea cloth, actually. Um, but uh, we had a mess up with Crossy, so we've got training soon, so I've got back to the usual wear. And look at those pins. Anyway, back to Mr. Tar. Hi. Hi. We're going to go now because we're going to the pub. OK, well, I'm just going to put some cream on Tina's back mice. <laughs> Can you please tell us what's happened here? I've come all over my skirt. Why? Because I'm excited. At what? Ah! rugby! <laughs> In the days when we was playing rugby, it was very much a social event. I mean, the majority of the games that I played, I played with an hangover because we was always out the night before on the pot, weren't we? And um, they used to have, like, um, there'd be a, a nurse's uh, club. So when we used to finish, me and him used to have a few beers in the bowls bar and then trudle up to the nurses' accommodation where they used to have um, events on, normally like weddings and things like which me and Mark always gate crash and things and uh, just just We'd pull out the sympathy card, won't we? Just get the lads in a wheelchair like this yeah. and they'd come out and say, Do you wanna come in? Oh thanks. <laughs> so we we had it all planned like. And um, our first real trip away would be uh, Dallas. We went to Dallas, didn't we? And a couple of the, the women that picked us up from the airport. We're having a party around at their hotel, which was around the corner. So, so we sloped off and went there. Yeah. But we did have an eight o'clock game the next morning. Yeah. So our coach had specifically said, none of our players will be going to the party tonight because we've got a very early morning game. I couldn't understand why they weren't performing, why they weren't playing like they'd been playing the day before or the previous couple of days. And it, it was later on after that game that I'd found out that Quite a number of them had been out on the piss. Ah. <laughs> so that was it then, shit hit the fan and yeah. we played and when we got back to the hotel he sent everyone back to the room and said, when I ring your room you come up to my room. And each one of us went up like a naughty schoolboy getting a bollock in. I said that he let himself down really, that, that he had the ability to be a world-beating player, you know. Uh, and that he'd really let, let himself down by, you know, this kind of attitude, really. Uh, I, I mean, I can't exactly remember exactly what I said to them, but I really wiped the floor with some of them, especially the, you know, the players that I considered to be 
uh, world beating players or the potential to have world beating qualities Rob Tarr Mark uh, and one or two others as well yeah I said to him, he, he said, you know, I told you not to go to the party and all this lot. I said, well, I'm not bothered, Brian. I, you know, I don't give a shit. You've not played me all week. I've come all the way over here. I've had to pay my own way to get here. Um, so what's wrong with going out and get pissed? And he said to me, you've not played because you're not good enough. You're not, you're not the best three-pointer. So you're not, you're not getting played. You've come here for the experience. And I, I honestly thought, wrongly, in hindsight, that I was the better three-pointer. And um, he said to me, if I ever pulled a stunt like that again, I wouldn't play for Great Britain ever again. He said I could be the best if I wanted, but I wasn't at that time, so... I was, though. I won the best player award at that time. You got the best one player, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he made me realise that, you know, I was, I was... I had ideas above my station. I thought I was better than I actually was. And he brought me down to earth with a bump, and when I got back, I changed and got my head down, and that's when I started training hard. Mark travelled all over the world, but he was always vulnerable to sudden and serious injury. My spinal cord's totally severed, so the nerves that control body temperature regulation are screwed, basically, so I don't sweat. So when it gets hot, I overheat. Um, and when it's cold, I get really, really cold because, you know, it's just all messed up and there was worse to come. One day I was at home, I was in the shower, and all of a sudden it just hit me. Bang. And it is, it is like someone had just smacked me around the back of the head with a baseball bat. It was incredible. I couldn't open my eyes. The pep pounding on my head was incredible. I, th I thought I was going to die. Wheelchair athletes are very vulnerable. People with spinal injuries can't feel pain from those parts of their bodies that are below the level of their injury. Sometimes they don't realize they have life-threatening symptoms. And that was a desperate situation Mark found himself in. A lot of blood comes to the heart, which stimulates the artery, part of the arteries and vagal now, which produces very low heart rate very high blood pressure or escalating blood pressure. And because of the stimulation, sympathetic stimulation, they have produced goose pimple on their face and shoulders, redness, flushing, congestion of the nose. And in severe cases, it can produce so much stimulation of the brain that it can generate epilepsy or epileptic fit, leading to, if not controlled or treated, brain hemorrhage and sometimes it produces it, 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 it leaves hard to go in irregular rhythm and can lead to death I was screaming and my mum and dad came rushing and I said you're going to have to get a doctor and a doctor came because I was back home back then and um, he just gave me painkillers and it wouldn't go and I remember a mate of mine saying he had it once and I phoned him up and he said, you need to have an ephedipine tablet. You've got to bite it and put it under your tongue and it brings it back down. And uh, my dad went down to his house to get some for me and I took it and, and bit it back down. He was unable to, or his bladder wasn't emptying properly. So we, we taught him how to catheterize, him, him, catheterize himself and empty the bladder. Mark recovered fast and managed to get to Stoke Mandeville the very next day to play in an international rugby competition. And we played America in the final. We got to the final, beat Canada in the semi-finals. It, it was expected to be America and Canada in the final, so we, we pulled off a little bit of a shock there. Um, played America. America were light years ahead of everyone. They were so much strength in depth. They ended up winning, but later that evening we was in the bar and I was talking to a guy called Terry Vineyard, and he's, um, the, well, he was the US coach back then. He was also a coach at Tampa, and um, he asked me would I be interested in going over uh, and playing for his team. So Mark went to America to play for Tampa, and he did so well, he was made another offer. 
Connecticut. They wanted me and Rob to go over as a package. But Rob had issues going on in his life at the time and, and I wasn't too keen on it and I was doing other things. But I, I do look back at that now and I regret it because I think if me and Rob went over as a team, playing on a team in America, that would have been something else. So it was odd, an odd decision to make for both of us. But looking back now, I, w I wish I'd have done it. You know, I, I do. I think um, if these opportunities come along, you should grab it because I have not been offered one since. So <laughs> yeah, I should have got. I should have got on there then. Rugby wasn't a Paralympic sport then, but then it got into Paralympics, and I thought that's the only thing left for me to do with rugby is to go to the Paralympics. At the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, Mark and Rob kept a video diary of what went on behind the scenes. The stars of this highly disturbing and thought-provoking documentary are Mr. Robin Tarr. How you all doing there? And starring Mark Eccleston. Hi. What is your name? It's Mark Eccleston. What exactly are you doing here at the Paralympic Games, Mark Eccleston? Being pissed around, messed about and totally cracking up. Hi. Why are you wearing these clothes? Well, we were officially going to a government function. Um, buses didn't even know we were going. So we've been sat in the sun, which is 100 odd degrees, and we've been baking. So we've decided we're not going to go, we're going to get changed and go out. Is that right, Mr. Tarr? Are we going on the piss? Yes. You know, I was Great Britain captain, I got attention. Um, as, as the best one point player in the world, he got attention. And, you know, mid 20s, I was milking it. Uh, welcome to the tent house suite. As you can see, bags of room, luxurious. This is my bed. These are coke stains. Just hang on one minute. Could you please point to the coke stains again, Mr. Tarr? Are you sure that they're coke stains? Positive, because there's been no women about and I've not weaved myself lately. So it is. Okay then. Now, this is the accommodation that you're sharing with uh, your roommate, Mr. Eccleston. That is true, yes. Is there enough room? Uh, well, bags of room, as you can see, this is Mark's bed and this is my bed. So, any time Mark has to go to the toilet or get out of the room, you've got to get out of bed. I woke up this morning and I was had my penis washed. Actually, it was Mark thinking he was washing his penis. The rooms are that tight? Very tight. Unbelievable. And here we have Robbie Tarr's bed. Can they see some advert? <laughs> Your typical Spazzy's bed, as yeah. you can see. It's like the bleeding torture thing, isn't it? Yeah, and there you go for all you ladies out there. Hollow raspberry of Rob Tars calibre on dresses. <laughs> if you zoom in. It, it, it shows on the video that a 26 year old lad in a wheelchair and a 26 year old lad on the feet, there's no difference. Yeah. I'm still going to be a flirt and I'm still going to wind people up and I'm still going to get pissed and I'm still, you know. It shows that there's absolutely no difference between me and, and say Jimmy, my best mate, who's the same age. We, we... How patriotic is that, eh? It, you don't look at that video and, and see two blokes in a wheelchair, I don't think. Rob Tarr has just had his mail delivery. One. <clears throat> I'm sitting here looking at your photo. Yeah. Looking at everything you've done. Yeah. Just to touch you. I look at your lips and remember your kiss. I look at your shoulders and remember kissing your ears. <laughs> your neck, your chest, your arms. I remember where your hand touches and caresses every part of my body. Your legs, I remember sitting in the car, resting my hand on them and feeling the heat from your thighs. <laughs> I might overpower an urge to undo your trousers. This girl is sick. We have now been here five days and Rob Tart is still in bed. Lazy slob. With a bird, look at this. <laughs> Got yourself a chick, come on, show your face. What's his face as, as the camera hits him? What's he? Uh, when you've been out on the booze, like... No, I don't feel very well at all. Can you tell us what time you got in this morning, Mr Tarr? Uh, well, I'd estimate it'd be around five, six o'clock, but I don't really know because I can't remember anything after one. And can you tell us why you slept all night on the floor and, uh, and only got up at three o'clock this afternoon? Uh, I misjudged my transfer when I come in and missed the bed completely and fell on the floor. So you've been asleep on the floor all night, all morning? Yes. You know, we finished fourth, uh, which, you know, you've got to do really well to finish to finish fourth and you get nothing for fourth. Uh, but the, the team performed really well. I, I, I was a little disappointed and thought that we might have finished third. Uh, but, you know, 
Dave's, Dave's the brakes. OK, Rob, um, we've just played New Zealand and got beat. How do you feel? Uh, Sum it up in one word. Shit. What else you got to say, Marky Mark? Not a lot. And the funky bunch. I'm getting extremely drunk. <laughs> <laughs> OK, buddy, you're on. This is Trey, having, Mark having, signing Trey's ball on his 40th birthday. There's Big Rob Tarr, his drunk partner in crime. He said to me, he said, uh, you've played this before, haven't you? Well, kind of. He's got a long reach, though, that one. Obviously doesn't know who I am, right? But... Oh, these all new, new players. Been me, you'll call me legend now. Quite rightly so. Well, I don't know. I, don't know, don't bit, I think Troy's been a bit childish, though. No? Troy won't even look at me. Hey? Troy won't even look at me. I've asked him to pass the ball. I'll pass the ball, he won't pass it to me. Yeah. You know, he was arrogant, cocky, you know, and uh, which I didn't like. I was a new player. I didn't like that at first, but it. But because of that arrogance and that cockiness, it gave him confidence on court, you know, and once I became more involved in the game and seeing that's what you needed to be a good player, you know, I wanted to be a player like that. I wanted to be as dominant as he is. Mark always thrived on, on that sort of confidence. He tries a bit of a prima donna. Can be a bit, uh... and obviously, he's a bit threatened now, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll give him six months. I'll be kicking on these lots, aren't I? Back in England, Mark was not sure what to do next, though he knew he had to find some goal to pursue. I'm one of them people that I know when time's up on something, you know, when I've had enough, that's it. It's done. I've done it. I'm glad I've done it. Move on. So that was it. I knew that, did it. And I'd actually seen him on a rugby court before I ever saw him playing tennis. I didn't pay as much attention to rugby as I did tennis back then. Uh, rugby was something I did for training and conditioning, but it wasn't like I was looking out to see who the competition was or who I needed to worry about. So I was aware of Mark, but not concerned about him as an athlete, so to speak, in a team sport and being one of a, a member of a team, but, you know, knew of his ability. Quadriplegic players often can't hold the racket because they don't have the strength to do that, so they have to tape it to their hand. I'd always been a team sport person. And I wanted to, to, I wanted a new challenge, and uh, I just thought a one-on-one -on -one tennis thing was a new challenge. So I started practicing and started training. Type of racket you have? So I'm gonna have a look at this. So I went up, um, had a look, tried it. Um, thought, yeah, this is all right. This actually. So years to work out. Rick Draney is the most successful wheelchair tennis player ever and he was crucial in persuading Mark to take up the sport. Um, he played rugby, but he was also the best quad tennis player at the time. And he said to me, he said, you know, you, you, you've, got a, you've got an eye for this, you should take it up. So I did. He's got a big forehand, uh, which most quads generally have one side that's going to be stronger than the other if they tape the racket into their hand because they've got to pick and choose. Uh, his mobility is good, his intelligence is good, his on-court awareness is good. Um, if we were going to pick on Mark, we'd try to pick on his backhand. The heat, I think, was a factor that was more in my favor the longer a match went on, just because I sweat a little bit and Mark doesn't. So I know if we played someplace that was hot, I was hoping the match would go longer because I knew that that would have more of an effect on him than it would on me. He had a, an excellent coach, he was progressing well. He would occasionally lose matches he should never have lost. Um, and he came to me in a very frustrated state saying, no, bloody thing, it's a useless damn game. And, uh, and I had him and I should have beaten him and I didn't close him off. And all, all these things that, that he would come out with. And we just really got him to sit down and focus on why was it he was having those difficulties. And essentially it was because he was trying to push it. He saw the end of the game before he'd played the point. And by actually ena enabling him to focus on the, the individual shot and to, to practice those events and make sure that those, those shots were always in the same place, um, he, could, he could win the shots and he did win the shots. In a dramatic game in Barcelona in 1998, Mark nearly beat Rick. Mark had been playing long enough to where he was starting to show his skill and ability and that was coming through. So the level of play was increased as well, just the overall drama, the experience, the opportunity, everything added up to make 
I thought, you know, just an exciting competition. And again, I was fortunate in my match against him to come out on top and was pleased to do that. But I think we were also very caught up just in the opportunity to be there. And we all felt that we had succeeded in showcasing quad tennis at a high level at an elite international competition. It took me years to beat him, and when I finally beat him, you know, he wasn't like any of these knobheads that spit the dummy out and, and storm off and don't speak to you. He said some very kind words to me after beating him. Um, on one hand, I was pleased for Mark because I know it had been something and it had been a goal of his for a while. And there's no way to say this without getting maybe sounding a little bit cocky, but there weren't that many people that were beating me. So it was kind of an elite club, I guess, if you will, at the time that he was now a member of. And so, like I say, I was happy for him in that respect because I could see that he felt good about, you know, all of the effort, the time and training that he had put in. But at the same time, when you're competitive, nobody likes losing. So I didn't enjoy the losing, but again, it was another opportunity for another rivalry to develop that was really why I played tennis. It wasn't about the wins and losses. I honestly can't tell you what my record was against any player head-to-head -head or overall anything like that. I know I had successes, I know I did well, but I just loved getting on the court and competing. So to have Mark show what he was capable of doing was exciting, not only just for me, but for the division as well. He just said to me, you know, I always knew you were going to be a great player. You're going to go on to be world number one. And I knew you'd beat me eventually. Um, you deserve it. And, and for him to say that, the second I've beaten him, you know, says a lot for the blow. The one thing that he can take with him is that the last time we played competitively, he beat me and beat me pretty soundly. I had had a couple of good wins in the tournament, thought things were going pretty well for me and ran up against him. So this was just for fun today. I guess maybe I've got a little bit of bragging rights, but in a, in a match, he's the one that still can claim the last victory between us. By 2001, Mark had a real hope of becoming world number one. But then he faced the worst crisis of his life since he was injured at 16. Before I went to Florida, even though I knew if I won it, I'd get to number one, I just had this feeling that I didn't want to go. It was like, I don't want to go. But I found it bizarre because it was like, well, if I win it, I'm going to be the best in the world. So that was strange. And then we, did, we went and had a hit. I went back to the hotel and a couple of us said, oh, come on, we'll go down the shopping mall. And I lifted myself into the, the hotel bus and I think that's where it, where it happened. I went to the shopping mall and I'm pushing around the shopping mall and my, my right arm just started getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And um, I got back to the hotel and I couldn't move my hand. So I just thought, well, it's, it's jet lag, it's tired, it's stuff like that. I'll go to bed and see how I am in the morning. Went to bed, go up in the morning, couldn't move my right arm. Immediate reaction, it was a syrinx. Now, syrinx is like fluid on your spine that, that gets into the nerves and causes more damage. And I knew people that had that had, had syrinxes and it's, it's a fucking big operation to rectify the situation. And I shit myself, I thought, if this is a syrinx, no way do I want to go through that operation. My consultant, Mr Sony, looked at the, the, the MRI scans I'd had a couple of years before and he looked at the MRI scans I'd done in America and he wasn't convinced it was a syrinx and I think in the end he, he, he arrived at the conclusion that it was um, discs, like a pincer effect on my nerves, that discs were pinching on the nerves. And I spent 10, week, uh, 10 days in hospital and I lost quite a lot of function in my hand. That hand was like that hand, and that's what I lost. He suddenly couldn't compete anymore, and he was in the depths of despair for a while. Um, now, fortunately, the, the extent of that trauma wasn't as bad as he first feared. So a lot of it, as, as with all of us, it's the fear of a, of a trauma rather than the reality of the trauma that makes us feel we won't cope with it. Um, but yeah, he, he found it difficult, but again, through a process of adjustment to that and an accommodation of that, of how that would affect his game, it suddenly didn't affect his game because it was now part of him. He accommodated it and moved on with it, moved on with his game despite it, really. I made the massive mistake of, of, of playing a tournament too early. And I always remember, I, um, I think it was, I got to the semi final, I think it was the semi final. And uh, I'd won the first set. I was five love up in the second set, so he had it in the bag. And my arm just went again. Totally went limp. It was spasming. It was doing this. It was, it, and I weren't giving up. No way was I giving in. And I carried on stupidly and lost seven games in a row. 
lose the set, lose the the second set seven five, and then I lost the third set six love. And then you had dickheads going at, choked and calling me a choker. People that aren't worth shit on my shoe. He he spent a lot of time um, learning the behaviours of his of his opponents, and that's that's where you win or lose games. And what I mean by that is that. Um, certain opponents, if they started to struggle, would try to slow the game down, and that would irritate Mark to start with. And he'd want to rush it because he knew he was going to win, so he wanted to rush the game. But I said, no, you've got to not allow them to outpsych you. You've really got to slow down your game even more and upset them even more. So he had to learn control, which for any, any young man at that stage is quite difficult to do. And it's a matter of being able to manipulate a game to your advantage and make sure you always believe you're on top. And that's, that's what he learned to do. Mark always laughs with me about when I took him over, he was ranked number four in the world. And after four or five months of working with me, he'd gone down to number 19. So he always jokes about the fact that I'm the only coach who's taken him from number four in the world right down to number 19. But the reason for that was that we were um, at that stage, we were developing this technique and, and breaking down his shots to sort of rebuild them again. And it was going to take a little bit of time for it to come together. But in the end, he moved back up. I took time off, um, made sure that everything was right before I came back. I came back, went to Japan, won again and started to climb the rankings. After a series of victories, Mark finally became the world number one quad tennis player. Rick Draney knew exactly what being number one felt like. You can try to put in words what it means, but until you've experienced it for yourself, you just can't truly relate. So as grand and glorious and wonderful as it feels, and when you think about all the time and the training and the effort and the sacrifice and the commitment that goes into it, uh, it is extremely rewarding. It's you know one of the greatest feelings in the world to think that literally you're the best in the world at something. I'm the first British player at any level, whether it be disability sport or able-bodied Disability tennis, or able body tennis. First British player ever at any level. Your Edmonds, your Rosetskis, your Murrays, your Giant Mysteries, your Pete Norfolk, whatever, and at any level to be world number one. With success, Mark even got a contract for modelling sports gear, the last thing he'd ever expected. Then the BBC asked him to attend one of their award ceremonies. To be invited along was a great honour because, you know, all the premiership footballers will be there and everything else. So I went and I got there and, and I was sat at a table and somebody from the BBC came over to me and said, Mark, can you just come and have a look and see if this ramp's too steep? So I went with them and they showed me the ramp getting onto the stage. The award made him realise he still had one ambition, to win an Olympic medal. His doctor told him he could do it. I still want you to have a last go without any worry. I would like to see you in Athens. Here come the athletes. A tremendous reception for the record number of 4,000 athletes from a record number of 136 teams. It's a hacker with a difference as they bang the sides of their wheels. It makes a noise like a big timpani. And there's the captain of the British team, Rob Tarr, facing up to his opposing number. He looks completely unmoved. Rob Tarr was now captain of the rugby team. The wheel so the two field. friends now, shared another they Olympics. They need to get points quickly. Troy Collins will provide one of them. And now they need to stop New Zealand from scoring. And they need to take the ball off them. And Darren Ransom knows it. Rob Tarr. In the wheelchair tennis singles, Mark lost in the quarter final. But with Pete Norfolk, he made it through to the doubles final.
Mark had to serve so they could stay in the match. It's the biggest final you can play in, and until you've lost in the Paralympic final, don't tell me it's great to have a silver medal. Because I lost in the Paralympic final, then I had to sit on the rostrum and listen to the national anthem. Then I had to go out and, and, and see all people from the Great Britain set up laughing and cheering and happy that we'd won a silver medal. You could have nicked that silver medal off me then. You could have threw it in the bin, you could have done what you wanted, and I would not have given a shit. You've got to understand me, I, I, I don't like losing and I'm a winner and, and I lost an Olympic final. And, and you know, I've got to live with that for the rest of my life that I lost, I lost a Paralympic final. Not any old final. Not, not, not your county club championship final or whatever. This was the biggest final you could ever play in. And, and it hurts to lose. After Athens, Mark retired from elite tennis. Today, he lectures and he goes into schools and tells kids about how he pushed the limits. A lot of people say I'm bitter, you know, even people close to me say I'm bitter. And, and maybe I am, but maybe I'm just disappointed that my efforts, you know, the training I put in, the injuries I had to endure, the, the shit I had to deal with, hasn't been recognised. Got beat in the final though, but we don't talk about that. Was it um, a tennis wheelchair thing? Yeah, wheelchair tennis. Yeah. There was a bit on the video, did you see it? Yeah. Yeah. You see the fireworks? Yeah. You like them? Yeah. There's a fire on the big screen. Yeah, that's, that's the Olympic flame. It's disgraceful. I think, first of all, it shows that we don't treat, or the media doesn't treat disabled sport with the, the respect it deserves. But also, I think, in a wider issue, it's how about we treat our heroes and our sporting heroes in this country? Because certainly, I think he's one of the, without hyperbole, one of the greatest sporting heroes the country's probably ever produced. One moment, one bad fall, made Mark what he is today. I used to avoid looking at it. You know, when I was driving down the motorway and I'd pass it, I'd, I'd consciously make an effort not to look across. But, I mean, it was 20-odd years ago now, and it, it's... I can't change it. It means nothing to me anymore. Something happened to me that I didn't want to happen. You know, I, I'm pretty pissed off it did happen. You know, there's, a ne there's never a day goes by where I'm not pissed off that I think, you know, maybe go again. Because, I mean, silly things like dreams. I'm walking in my dreams. And then when you wake up, you realise it's a dream. Pretty kick in the nuts, if you ask me, you know what I mean? So, you know, I was put in a situation I didn't want to be in. And because I was such a young age, it's like, well, do I give in or do I do something with myself? And if I give in, I've got a long time to go, sitting around doing nothing. So I just, I just did what I enjoyed doing, which was sport. And, you know, the, the reality was I was good at sport. So I ended up being successful, but I'm nothing special. And like I say, if I was, I wouldn't have been doing somersaults into haystacks, would I? God save our gracious Queen. Long live our noble Queen. God save the Queen. 
Na 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 na, send a victory, happy and glorious, want to reign over us, God save the Queen. And how do you feel, Mr. Tar? <laughs> I feel pretty good and really patriotic. Thank you very much. I'm a poor old soul, and with so many people, I'm going to ruin the flag for my anus. And on that note, bye-bye.